Hey, it's Silver, and this is Dread Templar. Uh, this is a game that's been in early access for quite a while, but I managed to get access to the full 1.0 release of the game a little bit early, thanks to Fulcrum, so thank you for that. And I wanted to make sure to take a look at it, because I thought it looked really interesting from all the screenshots and stuff, and the little bit that I've heard about it, and it turns out to have been one of my favorite boomer shooters of the whole genre revival, because it just does a whole lot of things right. Uh, pretty much everything it does, it does very competently, but there are a few specific things that it really, really excels at. But first off, just in general, what is it? Well, it is of course a boomer shooter, a retro throwback shooter that is pretty much entirely shooting first and story never. The kind of game with a large multi-episode framework, with each episode having several maps in it, and of course each map having its own large set of secrets and different enemy types to face. You have quite a large variety of weapons at your disposal, of which you can hold the entire arsenal at once, and you move really, really fast, so it's the fun kind of shooter. But the first thing to talk about is one of the game's headlining mechanics. You've probably noticed by now that uh, electric -y blue gauge at the top of the screen, and that is bullet time. Yes, this is a game that has bullet time in it, so we're back in like 2004, and I am happy with that because bullet time was always fun. It's just always a blast to use, and uh, in this game, in fact, the bullet time is the really fun kind where you still move at full speed, but everything else slows down. This is not one of those games where the bullet time also slows you down. This is also extra relevant because as far as I'm aware so far, at least, there are no hit scan enemies in this entire game. Everything is projectile based, which means it's important to be able to dodge all those projectiles. And if you waltz into a massive room with 8,000 enemies about to kill you, then it's really nice to have some, uh, some, something to fall back on to uh, be able to get yourself out of there alive because there's about to be a massive wall of projectiles heading towards you. So yes, bullet time is very welcome in this game and is well utilized as a big part of the combat. Uh, it does use up the gauge very quickly, so you don't get long in bullet time. And it uh, tends to refill itself when you kill enemies, that's the main way to refill it. And of course more difficult, big enemies will give you larger chunks of it at once. But you'll also sometimes find these glowing blue orbs placed around the map. And uh, these will fill a large chunk of it at once when you collect them. And you'll tend to find that these are often placed uh, right before massive rooms. Places where there's about to be a huge battle and the game is giving you a nice little nudge saying, hey you might need this in a second. But of course, one of the most important aspects, if not the most important aspect of one of these old-school throwback shooters, or, well, most shooters in general, to be fair, what's the arsenal like? How does the gunplay feel? And uh, in this case, they've gone a pretty interesting route with the guns, because it's sort of a mix of equal parts real-life stuff that's pretty grounded, and some more fantastically stuff that's definitely not so grounded, but is really fun to use. And uh, the game also uses a bit of an interesting uh, change on the alt-fire system, because in this game, none of the weapons actually have alt fires. However, right click still does something because the way it works is a lot of the weapon slots are actually two weapons and right clicking switches between them. So for instance, you'll start with dual pistols as one of your weapons. They are very effective, they fire very quickly, and they're surprisingly accurate. But eventually you'll also get dual SMGs, dual suppressed SMGs no less. And all you gotta do is right click on the pistols and you will automatically switch to these and right click again to switch back. Because there are of course different moments where you might want to use each one. They both use the same ammo type but are very different in terms of their situation which you might want to use them. Another one is the shotgun. You will get a pump shotgun very early in the game. It's a very good video game shotgun. It has a pretty good range on it, but of course it wouldn't be a classic throwback shooter if it didn't have a super shotgun, and in fact, yes it does. There is a double-barreled shotgun that you can right-click to switch out to from the pump shotgun. It uses double the ammo per shot and has a much shorter range, but of course tends to jib enemies in huge red clouds if you're very close to them, and will stay reliable throughout the entire game. But uh, you also have a couple of more unorthodox things, like for instance the other weapon you'll start with are actually dual katanas. They swing very fast and do a pretty good amount of damage, although they are of course very close range, but if you right click with them you will uh, attach them together as one sort of double-ended katana that you then throw when you left click. And the throw is really strong, it will jib all of the basic starting enemies and it will also pierce through, as far as I can tell, like an infinite number of enemies in a line. It'll just keep going. But the uh, downside is is that once you throw it, you don't have a katana anymore for a bit because it's on cooldown. So you have to either punch things or switch to a different ranged weapon while you're waiting for your katana to come back. And you've also got some other really fun stuff like the trap launcher, which is a gauntlet that fires these electrical traps that do a surprising amount of damage and also stun enemies with like chain lightning around where they go off and you can lay them around if you think you're about to be ambushed or if you know you're about to be ambushed because you died already or something like that. You've also got a rocket launcher and there's something about this game's rocket launcher that's really 
fun. It's like it's a combination of a surprisingly high fire rate, a very fast projectile, and kind of a compact blast radius. It's a really satisfying rocket launcher to use, although you cannot rocket jump with it. Please do not try that. It is not Quake's rocket launcher, but it is a super fun one. It actually reminds me a lot of the Doom Eternal rocket launcher. You'll also get an Infernal Revolver and a Black Bow. The Black Bow is interesting because you don't actually find ammo for it. Instead, the ammo passively regenerates over time. And uh, it's very strong. It does a lot of damage and is effectively hit scan, as far as I can tell, as well as the Revolver, which is equally very strong and pretty much hit scan. And both of those weapons are unique in that they actually have headshot damage. They're the only two weapons in the game that have it, but uh, if you manage to shoot whatever passes for a head on a specific enemy, then you'll see these little yellow hit markers denoting the fact that you just got basically a crit and it'll do a lot more damage. And there's also the Infernal Gauntlet, which is basically this game's BFG. You very rarely get ammo for it. It takes the uh, form of these big floating red sigils that glow very brightly, so they're usually pretty obvious from across the map. It only gets two shots from full ammo, but you charge it up and then let it go, and it basically fires this big red sphere forward that just insta-jibs everything around it that the sphere passes by. So it's sort of like a BFG without the explosion in a way. It's really powerful and really fun to use. There's also a very large amount of enemy variety in this game, which is another very big point for a shooter like this. You gotta have a lot of enemies to use your weapons on, or else what's the point? And in this case, there are tons and tons of different enemy types, all having various different threat levels to them, all having all sorts of different types of projectiles they can throw at you at various speeds and with different amounts of lead and stuff like that, so there's a good amount of skill in learning to maneuver around battlefields with these different compositions of enemies and how to dismantle them effectively without taking damage and stuff like that. It's a really good roster of very solid enemies that all have good silhouettes so you're never confused about which one is which. None of them look too much alike to cause you confusion or anything like that. Pretty much as soon as one spawns in you know exactly what it is and what it can do and how you have to deal with it. So the really fun weapons, the very punchy and satisfying weapons, combine with the really solid enemy variety to make the combat in this game an absolute joy. It is a very fun game to play through because it's just a blast to shred through everything in your path. You feel very powerful. I'm personally playing the game through on hard because I feel that it's kind of balanced for it, it almost feels like. It feels like you get the right sort of difficulty to health pack ratio. <laughs> when it comes to hard mode, I think it's actually a really good difficulty, but of course there is a difficulty even harder than that if you want. But I found hard personally to be a very healthy challenge that I very much enjoyed, and it seems well balanced. However, even after saying that the combat is definitely a star for the game, where the game really shines the most for me is in its level design. I think the maps in this game are absolutely amazingly designed. They are really, really good boomer shooter, retro, throwback, whatever maps. They are, like, extremely well designed. They can be very large, they can be non-linear, they can be more confined and have more of a puzzle aspect to them, they can have various optional side areas, they can be a lot of things, but they're so well signposted with really good use of lighting and enemy spawns and some other things like that to make sure you never get lost. And in fact, I've never actually gotten lost in this game at all, even after hunting for half an hour on a map because I want to find that one super secret that I just don't know how to get to, I've never actually felt lost or unsure of what to do in any of these maps, and that's a real testament to how well designed they are. They often have a lot of looping back to previous areas, unlocking new paths throughout the level. So oftentimes a level will be like a figure eight kind of shape in terms of its progression, where you sort of loop back on it eventually and open up new paths and you have like a sort of central hub area with various different doors and key card locked areas and stuff like that. It's just a real joy to explore these levels. Uh, notably there's also a really good mix of different types of objectives in these levels as well as different types of areas altogether from more claustrophobic tunnels with a couple of enemies here sprinkled here and there to sort of scare you. It keeps you on on low supplies and stuff to really big set piece battles and massive arenas and stuff like that. So it's not just about unbound variety it's also the fact that there's a really good balance between your more sort of linear windy areas and your big set piece arenas and they went absolutely ham with the secrets a lot of boomer shooters they'll select one type of old school secret and they'll stick with it like you know this game has 90 percent uh destructible wall secrets or this game has 90 percent misaligned textures that you press e on to open a hidden passage and all those things are totally fine but this game goes nuts with its secrets and it has a ton of different secret types it's got the destructible walls it's got the misaligned textures it's got hidden shootable switches and all sorts of spots it's got timed doors and hidden cranks and it's just so much and in fact 
fact, there are also these super secrets, as they're called in various levels, that often have all kinds of esoteric ways to actually reveal them that involve sometimes entire level-wide sets of puzzles you have to solve to finally open them. And there will be different, like, posters and notes and little hidden bits here and there to help you understand, like, what the secret is to sort of get it. It's really cool. The people that hid the secrets in this game, they have elevated secret hiding to an art. The levels are just so well designed and packed with all of these really interesting secrets that they're just a joy to play through over and over again because they have a lot of really memorable sections and I've so far haven't found one of those that one sections. You know what I mean? That one section that prevents you from liking that map because you hate having to repeat that one part. I haven't found that any of these maps have that one part so far. Usually that's a sewer or something similar. But uh, in this game, I really haven't found any maps that I haven't liked all the way through. And they're so varied. Uh, they're entire maps that you have to tackle in a non-linear order with various puzzles at different edges of the map meant to unlock something in the center to some sort of final boss. Or there could be a more claustrophobic, windy catacomb of a linear map that is all about uh, hunting for secrets in the walls to help you survive because it's kind of starving you on ammo and health kits and stuff like that. It's just, it's a really well-designed set of maps that are all very memorable, and often each episode is capped off with a boss. And although the boss battles are not as good as the actual levels themselves, they are still pretty memorable boss battles because they tend to be multi-phase kind of slugfests that make you use everything at your disposal to try and down them. By the way, speaking of secrets and things at your disposal, something I should have mentioned earlier is there's an upgrade system for your character and for your weapons. You can find these runes throughout the maps that give you various passive upgrades when you set them at an altar. Uh, you just go to an altar and you find these blood shards, often in secrets, but sometimes in the open, and uh, you can spend blood shards to open up slots that you can slot these runes into to improve something. So you can just spend these shards to unlock slots on your favorite weapons and then find the various uh, runes that you found for those weapons and slot them in there. And they range from simple stuff like being able to carry more ammo, more maximum ammo for those weapon types, or having them simply deal more damage, which can be really useful, especially on like the shotgun and stuff, because, you know, ammo economy for that weapon is always important to some more advanced stuff, like being able to generate black bow arrows passively more quickly, or being able to uh, have a wider blast radius on a rocket. And you can also find uh, these gold runes, which are usually in super secrets or other very hard to reach areas, but gold runes change a lot about a weapon, and they tend to be very, very powerful. Like there's one, for instance, that changes the dual pistols to these dual like hellfire repeaters that can fire these uh, bolts of like piercing flame that goes through whole crowds. You could change your trap launcher into a sort of Halloween pumpkin themed one with the extra effects that's like a bit overpowered. You can also do some other kind of ridiculous things like making your dual pistols deal massive damage while you're in bullet time, but only while you're in bullet time. Fittingly, that one's called Neo, by the way, of course. And uh, a lot of the golden runes will actually change the physical appearance of the weapon they modify, but not always. So these are really big effects that are absolutely worth trying to trawl the levels up and down for to find because they they're just so powerful. But that's my view on Dread Templar. It's got its systems in the right place. It's got just the right amount of upgrading and some bullet time thrown in there to spice the mix up, but it's uh, underneath all that got really solid combat with a very fun arsenal and absolutely impeccable level design that should be taken as a really good blueprint of how to design levels for a retro throwback shooter like this because they have such variety in objectives and secret types and all this stuff that just makes them a complete joy to play through. Personally, I think Dread Templar is a steal at its full price, and it's absolutely worth getting. I, I hope it doesn't get lost in the crowd of games like this that are continuing to come out, because, you know, the whole boomer shooter thing is a big revival, so there are lots of them, and where there are lots of them, it's easy to get lost in the crowd, and I really hope that doesn't happen with Dread Templar, because it deserves to stand out because of its amazing levels, and its really nice art style and atmosphere. So thank you guys very much for watching. I will, as always, put a link to the Steam store page of this game in the description below this video so that you can check out the full thing for yourself. Highly recommend it. I'll see you guys next time.